to Twitch. Uh, and check it out. I may be live right now. It says we're offline. Um, let me check to see if... I'm seeing you on Twitch right now. Am I on Twitch? I believe so. On, yeah, on David yeah, J. Felix? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, let me get out of here real quick. Or I, see, I see myself offline. I'm seeing you at least. I'm sure it's your audio. I'm trying to bring you in here. Oh, I see Software Craftsmanship is, on, is live now. I see myself. Yeah. It's on a small on. delay. I do appear yeah. to be on. Okay. Cool. I guess we'll leave here and go there. Yeah, we can do that. Oh, the echo's back. Alright, I'm good. Okay. See you guys. Hey, everybody. Uh. Alright. Hey everybody. Can you hear me? Say something in chat if you can if you can hear me. <laughs> I can see people on um, uh, on viewers when I'm in a different client, but I don't see any viewers. Uh, we have a slight echo. Uh, give me one second here. How's the echo now? Okay, I just I just removed the audio capture device. As long as you can hear me, that's perfect. Um, all right, so I'm gonna use my phone for chat. For some reason, chat isn't showing in Streamlabs, but uh, we'll live because I can't see it anyway. All right. Uh, so I think people are starting to trickle in. Uh, less echo. Is there any echo at all? Um, People are starting to trickle in here, uh, and um, I think we can start to get uh, get this going. Um, I'm David Felix, uh, and today I'm presenting for the Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship Meetup. Uh, I know some of you are um, coming to us remotely, perhaps. Uh, I did send this to a couple of people, um, but Cincinnati is a great place for tech. Um, and uh, while we're getting started, I just wanted to uh, take a second and um, remind everybody that uh, everybody's sort of going through something right now uh, with this, you know, increased distance and um, time away from their friends and their coworkers. Uh, and mental health is a is a big um, problem for a lot of people. Uh, so if you have any friends that you think might be struggling or you haven't heard from them in a while. 
Um, it doesn't hurt to reach out and ask them what's going on. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, a lot of them will, will appreciate it. And uh, even the most introverted people uh, do really appreciate it. So um, reach out to your people, uh, keep in touch. You know, Just because we're far away doesn't mean we have to be far away. So that's just something I wanted to say. Um, but I think uh, people are here now and um, I think we can get started. So um, I'm here to talk about serverless. Uh, and the title that I have today for you is Services Serverlessly. Um, how I stopped, uh, learned to stop worrying and love the cloud. Uh, so what I'm thinking here is, is that um, serverless is a lot of things, but for most people, what it means to them is um, referring to the backend services and services that, that run their operations. And to me, that is more than just an ideology around um, building smaller pieces that work together, but it's actually an ideology that um, builds on the cloud and is a cloud first design. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about that today. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I've been working for three years um, professionally in serverless. Uh, I started back at a financial company um, in 2017, and uh, when I joined, I hadn't, you know, I thought I was joining a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes shop, writing services um, for them and, in AWS. And uh, my manager at the time said to me, "Hey, what do you think about serverless?" And um, we started building with it. And those three years were really great for um, feature development and uh, really buying into a cloud-first ecosystem. Um, I personally am cloud-obsessed. Anybody who knew me back in the Kroger days would tell you all about how um, I would talk about uh, using AWS on the weekends or some project that I was working on um, using cloud technologies. I really, I really do believe uh, that there's a lot of power out there and a lot of um, technology that you can utilize. Um, I've been doing DevOps professionally uh, for um, quite a while now, uh, I started in full, I started in backend um, and sort of made my way into uh, DevOps just out of a it was something I was good at and it needed to get done. Uh, I'd say about five years professionally doing DevOps, but um, in my personal life, I do everything. Uh, my side projects, there's nobody who's a front end engineer for me. Um, I write React, and if you uh, hang around some of the discords or slacks, you might catch me responding to React questions, in addition to a lot of the backend and database questions um, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm the founder and CEO of NullServe. Uh, NullServe is, is my company that I founded um, in order to pursue uh, working with people on serverless operations and um, making, de making developers' lives easier using serverless. Um, you can find me on all of the major media, including Twitch, uh, at, at David J. Felix. Uh, make sure you get the J in there. Um, follow me on GitHub or Dev2. Those are where I'm really uh, on there a lot. Uh, or network with me. You know. um, and if you, have an email, if you have a question, you can always email me, uh, david at nullserve.com. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about what serverless is. Uh, serverless is utilizing cloud services through APIs to deliver custom business functionality. And that's a nice, succinct way of saying that. Um, but really what it means is it's anything as a service and using that as the bedrock for your application. So that might be functions as a service, which a lot of people think of when they think serverless, um, or the compute that's backing serverless. Uh, some people will think of backend as a service, which uh, you might think of um, Firebase or uh, uh, um, AppSync in, in the Amazon space or something like uh, MongoDB Atlas, um, Atlas, it might be Stitch, MongoDB Stitch uh, as a backend service um, that you can utilize. Uh, it might be managed queues where you don't actually have the queuing technology, you're just using a like PubSub, um, so Google PubSub or uh, Amazon SQS, SNS, those things are all what make up um, serverless. Uh, and as the ecosystem's getting stronger, you're actually gonna find a lot more of these as a service acronyms 
um, making their way into common parlance. Uh, the big one that people are talking about, and I'm predominantly going to talk about today, is this functions as a service, um, which is uh, compute um, through an API. So not just uh, computers through an API where you can call an API and get a virtual server, but you actually send them your code and it runs. Um, and again, this is the big asterisk. Everybody uh, in the comments section always likes to say, well, they're servers. Um, it's not literally serverless. Uh, it's not even literally without your servers. Uh, it's more of an ideology around this as a service mentality. Um, and I'm gonna explain some of the patterns that actually exist making this happen. So uh, this is where it gets a little bit hairy, is, is what services are we going to talk about today? Um, so I, you'll notice here that there are actually four items for my three-tier application. Uh, that's kind of a tongue-in-cheek. There's traditionally three in the three-tier application. That's why the name makes sense. But um, I decided that I wanted to differentiate some of the things that were on the edges between the three tiers. So with front end, sometimes people will shove the back end for front end into back end. Um, for ETL, sometimes that will lie on the back end, sometimes that will lie on the database side. Um, and I just wanted to differentiate those. But today we're going to be talking about four different types of technology and really zoom in on two of those in, uh, in particular. So. Um, all four of these work really well with serverless. So the front end, you might have presentational assets, which um, would entail something like your HTML, your CSS, your pre presentational client-side JavaScript, um, your SVGs, images. All of that stuff is presentational assets. And there are a lot of good serverless technologies for utilizing those. Um, we're not specifically going to talk about those today. Um, and we're not even specifically going to talk about some of the server-side rendering for those things today. Uh, even though some of them will overlap with what you hear. Uh, we are going to talk about backend. Um, so we're going to be talking about like CRUD API. So for anyone who's not familiar, that's create, read, update, delete. So just simple operation APIs. Uh, we're going to talk about authorization uh, and authentication. So when you see the NZ there, the N is uh, authentication and the Z is authorization. Um, and then the, you know, everybody's favorite business logic, the, you know, the, the catch-all for all of your complex business flow. Um, and we'll really dive into what patterns I think exist there and how you should try to differentiate those. Um, we'll also be talking about ETL or long-running jobs. Uh, I've heard in the past a couple people who, uh, hold on one second, stop listening, Alexa. All right. <laughs> um, so I've heard, I've heard people in the past say, uh, you know, our, uh, our long-running jobs don't fit in this compute uh, as a service. Um, they're, not, they're not suitable because of the way that, uh, that functions as a service operate uh, or the duration, the timeline, the space capacity. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that they frequently do and explain how they do. Um, data and databases is kind of, uh, it's a really fun serverless topic. Um, but it's not something that we're going to explicitly get into. Uh, I will talk a little bit about database technologies that you can utilize to make your backend services better, but we're not going to actually dive into data, uh, data or databases today. Um, so why these particular ones? So a lot of people will utilize um, CRUD APIs. Uh, you know, you might be calling this your REST services. Um, it might be your legacy XML, or um, you might have something that's a little bit more service oriented where it's not quite RESTful, but it's still this very, uh, I have a resource, I want to transition the state in some way uh, through interactions, and they are gonna be, they're gonna be relatively uh, cruddy, is what they call those, but um, where they're simple interactions. Uh, and serverless is really good for that. That was a bulk of the things that we wrote back at, uh, my, at the last company I was with. Um, and it's a bulk of what I write now uh, for null serve services. Um, you're going to find a lot of authorization and authentication. Uh, and there are a couple techniques in this area uh, that I want to differentiate from CRUD because of the state statefulness that's involved in them. Um, but really what we want to talk about here is how do we allow these services to actually do validation, verification, and permissions checking um, in a reasonable amount of time. 
um, and just show some patterns for that. And then we have business logic, which uh, I'm actually going to break up into three specific things that trip people up, uh, that make them not cruddy. Uh, one of those things is going to be transactions, um, transactional flows uh, that are more complicated than just creating or updating. Uh, can be really problematic for people trying to model that into a serverless ecosystem. Um, and it can actually be really prob uh, problematic for people developing for regular applications. It just doesn't show its face until much later in the life cycle of the application. Um, I'll also be talking about workflows, uh, which kind of blends in with transactions, um, and stateful transitions. So anything that involves uh, your server holding some state uh, that's going to be something that I talk about uh, coping mechanisms for. Um, for ETL, uh, really what I mean here, uh, so ETLs traditionally uh, extract, transform, and load. It's, it's, it's a technique used in um, data warehousing and data, data management um, that's moving data around. Um, but I like to think of long-running jobs as a form of this uh, because you're working through state as it transitions, but not necessarily actively at all times. It gets shelved a lot and re reorganized. Um, sometimes there's bulk work associated with actually bringing that in. Um, the one that I like to, the example that I like to give people is um, you upload a video or you upload an image to uh, your favorite image sharing site or um, YouTube or something like that. Um, they're gonna have to bring that in and make it fit for giving out to other users. They're gonna strip your metadata, they're gonna re-encode it, um, they're gonna shrink it to fit the right size. Those are all transform. Uh, so you're getting the data, extracting it, transforming it, and unloading it. Um, so we're gonna talk about those and how those work in the serverless ecosystem and how you kind of build um, callbacks and real-time notifications to let your users know uh, what's actually happening. So, um, you might be asking yourself, why serverless? Uh, you, you know, it's great that we have these things, but I've been building these things for years. Um, I like to use, you know, I like to use my Express app or I like to use Ruby on Rails for my CRUD. Um, why should I mix it up? Uh, well, I think that there's really an argument for reduced operational complexity. Um, and you pay a little bit upfront for that. Uh, it does take a little bit of, of time to get your things out there. Um, but once you do, the speed that you can turn around and say, uh, let's add hosts or let's, um, let's increase demand for this uh, is insanely small. So uh, because you're operating on generic hosts, your scalability um, becomes much easier. So like, you, can, you can horizontally scale by nature with this technology and that really becomes a benefit uh, for services that you're not quite sure what the load is going to be, you're not sure um, how people are going to flow through your application. There's a lot of unknowns when writing a new service and operating them can be really costly. Um, a lot of people have game plans where they say, you know, we're going to toss this into a uh, three node cluster for high availability and then we'll scale it as we need with like an auto scaling group. Um, and that's going to be a crazy overkill uh, for a lot of services that are starting out. Um, by nature, you get that out of the box with serverless, so um, you get a lot of those benefits for uh, relatively cheap. Um, you also get better DevOps, uh, and that's kind of an odd one to quantify uh, for people who are really good at DevOps, but I've been doing it for a while and I've never really had this kind of tool belt at my disposal. Um, one, it promotes immutability, which is like any any code base that has the potential to change or deploy that has the potential to change or drift from what you've deployed um, is a nightmare for DevOps. Uh, you almost become like uh, a bloodhound looking for that one thing that changed when it happens. Um, and you have all these tools at your disposal to check for it. And all of those are really built into the way that serverless operates. It doesn't let you uh, deploy something without it being auditable, without it being retraceable. Um, so it really promotes this idea of immutability. Uh, since your servers are all uh, Phoenix servers, so uh, they go away af after the end of things and they're not, they're not um, tailored directly to what you need, uh, 
they're not bespoke or a snowflake server, um, you get this benefit that it's not expected to be in some state without you telling it to be in that state all the time. So that's one of the really nice things. Um, but it also encourages a reduction in statefulness. Um, so functions, functions as a service, uh, if you're not familiar, will get spun up uh, on demand. So if I come in as a user wanting to operate um, some service, uh, it'll actually spin up a runtime uh, in under 100 milliseconds and start responding to my request. Um, and then it'll spin it down. Uh, or maybe it won't, maybe it'll keep it online. Uh, but the way that you code it is as if it spins it down. Um, I don't store session variables, I don't store uh, a local cache in this uh, function as a service. Um, it's totally stateless and it operates really cleanly because of that. Uh, reducing statefulness means that people can hop between any single one of them. You don't have individual machines getting hot spotted. Um, and it, it's really a beautiful thing for horizontal scalability. Uh, it also means that you can granularly scale things, which is like one of those areas that people always want to do in DevOps when you know their eyes light up when you say, oh, we want to do uh, canary deploys or we want to do blue green or rollouts. It's always on their mind, but the the uh, workflow and getting it in and getting it working can often be really problematic. And serverless really, really improves that. Um, you can deploy different versions of functions and point different people at different versions and test empirically how that interaction works. So it really does give you a better toolkit. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's uh, something that has dramatically improved my uh, developer, um, uh, fr like my, my life as a developer uh, writing back end services. Um, so that's, that being said, uh, I alluded to some of this. Serverless might be a challenge for you. Um, it's a challenge for a lot of people. Uh, and I, I'll admit that it did take me quite a while to really get fully spun up on how things work. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of infrastructure in the cloud um, and a lot of setting that infrastructure up and wiring it together that is difficult if you've never done it before. Um, and there's a lot of challenges that come from exploring this new area. Um, so I'm trying to provide the best guides that I can uh, to help you with that. Um, but one of the things that a lot of developers will encounter is that there's limited server interactivity. Um, you know, it's heavily wired through this infrastructure. It's, it's um, you know, rather than having a server that you can SSH into and uh, check the log file and see if the log, the tail appender is, is you know, pulling down from it or something like that. Um, it's relying on cloud technologies to interoperate. So what you end up doing instead is rather than checking file permissions, you're checking service permissions um, between these two services. And that can be a totally new beast for a lot of people who are um, experienced in the DevOps world. Um, I, I think it tends to be relatively intuitive when you get into it, but it, it is a challenge and I won't deny that. Um, it relies on a lot of external APIs, so getting used to reading other people's API documentation is um, can be a challenge. <laughs> uh, I, I, I found a lot of the APIs to be really well documented in the AWS ecosystem. Um, I've worked a little bit with uh, some of the other major compute providers uh, like Azure and GCP. Um, Google Cloud, that is, uh, and I've worked with uh, Cloudflare workers, and all of them are um, relatively good at documenting it, but there are some edges, and it's going to be a little bit different. So reading the APIs is going to be really important to success. Um, and the one that trips up a lot of people when I hear about them trying serverless is um, large frameworks and monolith patterns, they don't fit as well. Um, and I kind of want to be careful about saying that because I write my backend services as a monolith, but I don't write them in a monolithic framework. So rather than having something like uh, Ruby on Rails or um, a Spring Boot or Django providing a lot of controllers that all have one entry point on um, a single port, uh, what I have instead is I have, uh, I have Webpack 
pulling out each one of the functions and deploying them all from one code base into different functions. Um, and that's really nice because I can shake away the, the code that's unused, uh, but it does, it does pose a little bit of a, a different pattern that pe than people are used to. Um, a lot of people are used to just having uh, the whole framework there. Um, and you can still have all of the code that your other functions have alongside it, uh, but it's, it's different. So I think that I, I would say that's a challenge. Um, but the big thing that I want to I want to say is to avoid these challenges, you want to think event driven. Uh, and what that means is any interaction that you want to have with these services, you want to think of like an event. Um, you have an HTTP call, somebody's coming in and they want to get some resource. You want to think of that as an event that you need to respond to. Uh, not as a, a transaction that you need to fetch data, something that you need to respond to as soon as possible. Um, some of these calls are gonna be really easy for you to respond to quickly, and some of them will not. Uh, and that's what I'm here to talk about today, is how do you parse out the portions of the event that you want to respond to immediately, and how do you decide when you're gonna wait and respond a little bit slower. Um, so these, the, the challenges that we're going to focus on here today is uh, these slow, long-running transactions that uh, I talked about through uh, ETL um, and job servers. Um, a lot of them actually make their way into business logic, which is where you'll, you'll run into some problems. Uh, there are definite limits to uh, how long compute can hang out waiting for a response on HTTP servers. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, on later slides, but um, what you need to know is that you want to try to deliver a response to users as quickly as possible. So if you have a call that's taking five seconds um, and you might be butting up against some of those deadlines, you should find a way to split that up. Um, we're also gonna talk about stateful API behaviors and how I uh, managed to get rid of some of the uh, common ones. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about those jobs that you know are definitely asynchronous jobs, you want them to be offloaded and not something that users directly interact with, but they might fire off, um, but they're still too large. And how do, we, how do we cope with that and how do we scale that? So with, with long transitions, um, something that I alluded to is that you want to break up longer transition, transactions. So um, where a user comes to your HTTP server and they call it, and you might go make a long call that takes two seconds to reply. Um, it might be wise actually to break that up into smaller, more synchronous pieces rather than asynchronous call, asynchronous pieces. Um, and the way that you would do that is you actually serialize the state between those transitions and give users updates uh, on the actual action. Um, some some diehard uh, RESTful RESTful or uh, you know CRUD API proponents will say. Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't REST. Um, and I'd encourage you to think about your resources just a little bit differently. And rather than exposing some long resource to the create, uh, instead expose the job to the create. So somebody creates a job to create that and they don't actually create the long resource, they create the job that creates it. Um, and they get a call back immediately. The job was created, that's great, it's on the queue. We know about it, great. We can display something on the page for them rather than allowing them to time out. Um, and that's actually really great for user inter interactivity. And it's something you should be doing in any application, not just serverless applications. Um, you should also try to serialize your state between those trans transactions and transitions because uh, what happens is if you're waiting for some job to happen and your server happens to go down, you actually lose that. So if you have hundreds of users that are all waiting on these you know, six second calls, they won't get any response. Um, and that'll be a problem for them. With serverless, we give you a coping mechanism in that you can respond respond immediately, save off the, the state as it's transitioning, and then call that user back at a later, later time. Uh, and I really wanna emphasize, you should utilize a database for these state transitions. And you should store the state there so that any other worker that's listening for calls can pick it up. Not just the one that somebody's on, not just the one that has fresh cash, but all of them. It makes all of your services very horizontally scalable and you never have to worry about it after you figure out how to do that. Um, 
you should rely on non-compute resources for polling and for state. So uh, one of the things that you're gonna see is that uh, people will check on the outcome of jobs a lot. Uh, don't just have like a tight loop in your compute level that says like, is it working, is it working? Don't even really have a long loop. Uh, instead, you should be utilizing something like a queue to asynchronously get a callback about that. Um, you should be using something like a database to say, oh, this timed out. You shouldn't be pulling on that uh, or holding the state. Um, and again, a database should be used for storing the state. So making a good use of, of cloud resources like PubSub, uh, smart, smart queuing service, uh, th those type of services can be really useful for notifications and callbacks. And building around those events actually means that your compute is less utilized so you're paying less for these resources that are, you know, we're already paying less for. So you just keep saving. Um, there are still stateful APIs out there. Uh, API Gateway is one of the big ones. Um, when a user comes in and has a TCP connection that says, hey, uh, I want to connect to your HTTP server and I, here's my header, um, they actually get the, the TCP connection and hold that open. Um, and then buffer the entire message that they're getting and then send that to your Lambda. So you can use that for longer connections. Uh, they have WebSockets as one of the, one of the options uh, on Amazon's API Gateway. Um, but I would encourage you that if that's something that you think you need, don't hesitate to build a service that is the glue for your serverless level. And there's nothing wrong with building your own bespoke service uh, in a stateful manner. Um, and that was kind of what I alluded to earlier with the, uh, it's not even uh, not your servers. Um, you should build some things out uh, if you believe that they will dramatically improve your, your uh, services and your business logic. Um, they should be something that you build. Uh, so you want to focus on these fast user inter interactions and do the slow behind the scenes magic somewhere else. Okay, um, That's how you would do long transactions. Uh, and I'll actually show you some code for that in a, in a second, but um, I, I wanna go over some of the other challenges first. So the next challenge that you'll run into is, is the stateful behavior. So the local state is, is the killer. Um, there's a couple different terms for what people are gonna use uh, local state for. Uh, a big one is sessions. Uh, people will use an in-memory session store uh, or they'll use sticky sessions to try to save um, user interaction or like partial form data. Uh, they'll, they'll load some stuff from the database into like a in-memory cache. Um, they'll keep database connection pools. Those are all forms of local state um, and will be problematic in a serverless journey. Uh, they will be problematic in any scaled service journey, but since serverless scales at a much um, smaller level, you'll notice it earlier. So with sessions, um, this is something that is pretty easy to do. Uh, you can utilize a short, uh, short-lived or, or centralized state. So, like a, a shared cache is some way. Like uh, memcached uh, or Redis is a good option um, for session stores. Uh, if that's the way that you're operating sessions, um, sticky sessions are really good at the API gateway level. Uh, caching is really good at the API gateway level, um, where you cache at the edge of your service after authorization not you know, in your service. Um, but you should rely on some of the non-compute services for that state, not the actual functions as a service, not the place where you're writing your code. Um, for database connection pools, you should really be looking at something like a database proxy. So for anyone who's unfamiliar, um, a database connection pool is, is a way for the database client to hold open a couple different connections so that it can call out to the database with a couple concurrent things at once, but not enough to um, sync the database. And typically, something like a Postgres database will have um, a maximum connection limit somewhere in the ballpark of 100 to 500. Um, now, if you're running one of those in each Lambda, which is serving one user, you can see how that might be a problem. Uh, just like if you're running one of those in uh, each service on a 10 server service, and each one of them has 10 connections, how you might starve out um, your business analysts from having their connection. These are all challenges with having a database pool. Um, they're just something that you notice a lot sooner in your scaling journey. 
So what I would encourage there is to utilize a database proxy. Uh, Amazon has a service called RDS uh, um, Proxy, which will hold open the, the 100 to 500 connections that they're using for the database. And then it'll have unlimited TCP connections or a much larger limit uh, for your ephemeral services to utilize. Um, and they'll just block, which is the same thing that the, the pools do, but now it's split across all of your resources. So you don't have hotspots on, on given instances. Um, I'd encourage people to use that for any service, but for serverless in particular, I would say it's, it's a must. Um, API gateway for sp sticky sessions and cache, it's a very easy win. You can write your, uh, your edge servers so that they do this. Um, and I actually think that session is one of those ones that you can do uh, much more statelessly. Um, rather than storing each individual user's session, I would say instead you should be storing uh, the signing key um, or the, the public key or private key for signing these session tokens um, so that you can verify them without looking them up. Uh, and I think that's really like a, a strong way to operate. Um, I would also say generify all your servers. Uh, you want to make sure that any of your servers can take the work. So keeping state in any way that one of the servers is gonna be better at it than another is gonna hurt you. And that's something you wanna avoid. Um, the final, final challenge that, uh, hold on one second. Uh, I'm checking the questions here. Uh, referring to something more like, uh, so uh, the question in chat is, is that referring to something more like JWT? Um, yes, JWT is one of the ways of doing that. Uh, JWT is, uh, is really just a way of storing claims, um, but you can sign a J JWT and say, this is from this person. Uh, that would be how I would do it. Um, there are gonna be reasons why you wouldn't sign your JWT with the identity as well as uh, the session. Um, and you should make sure you investigate that. But you can always sign the session uh, in the same manner that you sign in JWT. Um, all right, so final challenge here. Uh, the ETL bulk work is too large. Um, I would encourage people to try to uh, think about their work in something that's more re-entrant. Uh, so what I mean by that is you have some work um, you want it to be resumable or um, pausable. And if it fails, you want it to be restartable. So that's how I would say you want your jobs to be re-entrant. Um, you should try to serialize all matters of state that make a difference. Uh, so if you're calling out to an API and making a change, you should be recording that in your database. Um, you should be checking that with the external API to make sure that it hasn't already been done. Um, but those things will help you with splitting your work horizontally. Uh, one of the patterns that a lot of people use and have seen work really well with these um, ETL workflows, uh, you know, in, in like the big data space is this map reduce pattern where you split your work up into smaller chunks um, and map that across a lot of workers. And then once they're all done, you can reduce them into one data set that's changed. Um, the thing that I want to remind people is that uh, bulk work for serverless doesn't necessarily have to be on serverless. Um, with AWS Lambda, you get a 15 minute deadline on your Lambdas. So if your work can't be done in 15 minutes, you'll have to split it. But that doesn't mean you have to use Lambda to do the work. Uh, you can actually use Lambda, Lambda to start up uh, worker servers uh, or increase your auto-scaling groups for jobs that are longer lasting or um, require more effort behind them. Um, and that's kind of the idea that, uh, you know, I hate to say that this limitation is them pushing you in the right direction, um, but you will save money by taking your extremely high compute jobs and pushing them off into something that is billable by the hour. Um, that's gonna be something that you really benefit from. And I think that while it is a limitation that sucks and everybody likes to say, oh, I can't believe Amazon doesn't just give us whatever, um, it's something that also can help you uh, and can help you lead you to the right direction. Um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. I've hit it before and been upset. That being said, it's not um, insurmountable. So I wanna show you guys some code, uh, y'all some code. Sorry, I'm trying to 
uh, change that. Um, this is, this is the uh, CRUD API. This is a uh, simple controller. Um, all it does is gives you a resource. Um, so with a CRUD, CRUD API, most people are used to this in a uh, JSON, REST world. Um, they might have a resource. Uh, in this case, it's called my resource, very clever. Um, and they might post to an, to an HTTP endpoint to create one. They might get from the HTTP endpoint to get one back, um, and they might delete to delete one. And that's the way that they're going to interact with the, with the API. Um, they might have something that's less restful and more uh, like they just post to a bunch of endpoints. That's fine. Either way is fine. Uh, both of them are CRUD APIs. Um, and I, I won't ever say uh, that either of those are necessarily wrong. Uh, they all have their places. And I think that building that uh, either way works great. So all that this is doing here is returning a status of 200 and your resource, which is this, this stringified JSON uh, of, hel of hello world uh, with an ID on it. Um, it's really that simple and it's not that interesting. Um, it's just like an ordinary controller that you might find in um, a regular web application. Once you've built out all of the, uh, once you've built out the infrastructure to host this, the actual code looks exactly like a controller. Um, for a lot of this, uh, people are going to say, you know, that seems like all I'm doing is is codifying a, a you know database or a backend. Uh, why don't I just use a backend as a service? And that's a great question to be asking. Uh, if you can, you should. There are some situations where you'll be merging data sets or you'll have custom authorization or business logic that will make you want to use compute. That's when you should use compute. Um, we used it for all of our services and used it to uh, interact with um, Oracle databases, with uh, SQL Server databases, uh, our MongoDB store, uh, and external services for all of our CRUD calls. And it worked really great, just like a, a normal controller that you might find in Django or Rails or, um, or uh, Spring Boot. So it's nothing that crazy. Uh, and it's good for durability and adding that durability to legacy code. Um, you can front old services with this, and it's not terribly complex. Um, but long transactions are something that are a little bit trickier. Um, so something that you might not have noticed is that um, that call was async, and I did return at the end of it, which means that I completed a promise in the JavaScript uh, language. Um, that actually gives Lambda the ability and um, opportunity to reclaim your compute resources to be used for another purpose. So. Uh, you actually want to reply last. Uh, and that trips people up sometimes because they want to do some work. Um, so this example here is actually showing you a longer transaction. And you'll notice that I fire off a, uh, an SQS. Uh, so SQS is um, Amazon's simple queuing service. Uh, but it's just a, a queue that has an HTTP API in front of it. Um, and I don't have a URL in there, you know, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't function as code. but um, it fires off this, this SQS and waits for it to reply and say, yeah, I got it. And then it replies to the user with a 202 status, which is actually accepted. Um, it's not created. It's not OK. Um, it doesn't promise that this slow resource is actually created. It just promises that you've, you've accepted the, the call. Um, and it gives you back an ID. Uh, IDs are pretty easy to generate uh, for your resources. Um, but it lets, it lets the user know that it's processing, uh, which is, is very important. Um, so that the user knows that there's some, some level of asynchronicity. Uh, we can argue until all of our faces are blue about how you should do that. Um, but this is the idea, is that you reply after sending out the call. Um, and you might actually uh, catch that down the line, which I'll show you. Um, so one thing that I want to point out is that it's not always destined for a queue. A queue is just a really nice, um, simple structure because it takes the, takes the result and doesn't want to give you back anything immediately. Um, but the big thing there is that we're isolating customer interaction, which is this HTTP call with the actual work. Um, so splitting compute where it makes sense and provides a better user experience and has different events 
is where you want to focus. Um, so resist, resist over-fragmentation where it's possible. Uh, reply in a crud-like manner when you can, but sometimes you can't. Um, and sometimes you're going to want to throw a bunch of callbacks around in a queue. And I'm going to tell you, don't do that. Uh, one call to a queue is fine. Uh, a couple calls to a queue, you should start looking at workflow frameworks. Um, all of the cloud providers provide these. Uh, and there's actually a lot of tried and true technology in the ETL space that you can utilize. Um, so Apache Airflow is actually one of the big ones that people use for, um, for ETL and stream jobs. Um, I know that people are utilizing Kafka uh, for, for managing uh, PubSub and, and getting work um, or RabbitMQ. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to fire it off to that and you don't need it to be serverless uh, for your job queue. Um, but if you want it to be, you can use Amazon Step Functions. You could use Logic Apps in Azure, which um, utilize their uh, function, uh, functions as a service. Uh, and you can use Cloud Composer. Um, which uses Airflow, it doesn't, it doesn't use their um, functions, but you could use PubSub uh, and kind of string them together. Um, and I want to say, try to favor pulling or pushing over waiting. Um, so what that means is look for an answer by pulling for it, uh, wait for an answer to be pushed to you um, by not doing anything until the job is pushed back to you in a callback manner, uh, but never wait for it. Don't wait for the job to happen because you're paying for every millisecond of that compute. So give it back to Amazon or give it back to Azure, give it back to GCP um, so that you can respond to your users and focus on the business logic that matters. So how do we actually get a call back? This is my favorite one. Um, so I alluded to this earlier, API Gateway actually supports WebSockets um, and it handles the state for you. When a user comes in, uh, it notices that they've connected and it stores an internal connection ID. Um, and you can actually save that. You can, you can hook into that behavior with a, with a Lambda. Um, you'll notice in the last, uh, so in the last calls, we've been, um, oh, sorry, I actually skipped a, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I pushed down. Um, so in these calls, you'll notice that the event is actually an API gateway event. Um, so it's the same thing as the HTTP event, but in this one, we actually have context that people are connecting to a WebSocket. Um, so when they've connected, we're actually gonna store that information over in a database uh, so that anyone can respond to it. Again, trying to serialize the state over to a store that we can get to. Um, and when they disconnect, we're gonna remove that from the database. That's all we're doing. Um, when they connect to the WebSocket, they're just there. They're not doing anything. They're not getting any information. Um, uh, your, users, your user will be uh, in her web browser looking at the page uh, and won't necessarily see anything. Um, you know, they'll just be connected. Uh, and we reply to API Gateway, uh, perfect, we're connected. Um, and they're just sitting there waiting for a callback. Uh, and then the back, background job can actually make that callback. So in the previous ones, we've had the event be an API Gateway event. Somebody's coming in from the web and we have this API gateway calling us to tell us, hey, we've got this compute that we need you to do. Here's the event. It looks like an HTTP event. Here's what it looks like. Um, in this case, we actually get an SQS event because we're uh, listening to the SQS queue uh, for work. And the user isn't waiting on this. This is an asynchronous job. You'll notice that the promise is actually void here um, because once it's done, uh, it's done. That's the work. So we have to make sure that we call back to the user if that's something that we want. Uh, we have to make sure we save that to the database if that's something that we want, or save it to an object store. Um, but these stateful services don't time out as quickly. Uh, and we can break them up further if we need to by moving them into a workflow. But what you can see happening here is that um, we're, talking to, we're talking to our database. I keep clicking on the page. I need to stop doing that. We're talking to our database um, and uh, hearing about the connections that we have. And after sleeping for 15 seconds, which is you know the epitome of doing hard work, right? You know, um, we're going to call back to the user and say all all people who are connected to the WebSockets, all you people who are out there, come in and we have some information for you. Your um, your slow resource that you you called to create 
has finished processing, so processing is now false. Um, it's a terrible name, I know. Uh, but hello world, it's there. And we can call back to them and they'll get that information through that WebSocket that's open. Uh, and we don't have to have that compute running all the time. We don't have to have something storing those connections or orchestrating where is the user connected because the service does that for us. Um, and we really get to leverage that cloud technology. It's really it, like um, getting that realization that Amazon's done it for you is really something that's kind of awesome. And I think that's, that's, that's great. Um, this, this similar, similar um, systems exist in other clouds. I'm most familiar with Amazon. Uh, but you can really leverage these services that your cloud is providing for you by utilizing the compute that hooks into them. Um, and keep in mind that these large background jobs, like I said before, you can create and destroy virtual server servers. You can increase your auto scaling capacity. Um, I attended a talk where people were saying that they had a, um, uh, a machine learning server and they had like a light switch that was on an HTTP, uh, you know, Lambda, and they would turn on, the, they would say, create me um, a machine learning environment. It would create them a machine learning environment. And then they would have a time to live on their database. And when, it, when the time to live was over, it would come in and, and check to see if this was still being used and turn off the machine learning environment and clean up after these scientists who were you know, doing work for the day. And it, I, you know, that was really mind blowing. I, I thought that was awesome. Um, so we'll talk briefly about auth. Um, we talked a little bit about JWTs before, um, but I wanna, I wanna differentiate a little bit here. So with authorization, uh, auth Z, um, that's whether or not a, a user um, can or can't do something, right? So is the user authorized to do this? We know who the user is, can they do that? Um, can Michael come in and delete all of my Facebook posts? No. Um, can he invite me to a Twitch you know, stream? Yes. So we would do that in the controller. Uh, those are all business logic um, and we should check that based on some database. Uh, but you should really try to treat it, we should you really try to treat it like CRUD. Um, the rules are, are immutable and if they're not, they should be in a data set that we can treat as somewhat immutable. Um, be careful about calling like LDAP servers. I know that LDAP servers can tend to um, be DDoS pretty easily. Uh, I'm not gonna write that on the page. Uh, hopefully people are using some auth service that, that abstracts that a little bit. Um, but if you're not, be careful. Uh, authentication on the other hand, we can use the API gateway we can use our third-party auth providers. Uh, we can use you know, Google's sign-in with Google. Um, and then pass that in your headers so that it gets brought in through that uh, and gets verified against central signatures uh, so that we can verify these JWTs for, for authentication. Uh, and you can do that either in the, the API Gateway. Um, API Gateway and uh, uh, Google's and Azure's um, both offer uh, or all three offer um, options where you can actually get those, uh, uh, get a callback that says, hey, is this user uh, authenticated? Yes, no, you know, are they authorized? Yes, no. So you can actually hook that into the API if you wanted to. Um, but I would say that the, the actual checking of that should be centrally located. Um, so let's, let's talk about some gotchas, the database. I alluded to some of this before. Uh, the problem, uh, okay, so this is actually, in two columns. I, I'm just now looking at it and realizing it kind of looks like a grid. It's not a grid, it's two columns. Uh, so the problem is we have databases, keep, uh, we want to keep connection pools um, uh, open, but they're not horizontally scalable. The solution is we use these database proxies uh, and very small connection pools. Um, there's only going to be one user in at a time. So unless you're looking to do um, multiple queries against the database on multiple connections, you should not be doing that. You should be pushing it through one connection. Um, so keep your connection pools small. Uh, it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, and treat them like they're going to go away in between every call, uh, and you'll never be disappointed. Uh, sometimes you will, but most of the time not. Uh, so the second problem column on the right, uh, we open the database connection every request, and that's slow. Uh, there's an asterisk here, people say this. It's slower, um, but the solution is actually you can open it in the initialization of the function before you're even responding to the user. Uh, and it'll, it'll initialize concurrently with the runtime itself. 
Um, so you don't have to actually incur that on the user's call. Um, I would also encourage you to work on having a database that responds quickly. Uh, the proxies are really good at this, uh, really good at signing requests quickly. Um, Postgres should be good at this. Some of your more expensive databases may not be, and I would encourage you to look at um, how you can put a CRUD server in front of those so that you don't incur that at your serverless layer. Okay, so bonus. I told you I wasn't going to talk about this, but we're going to talk about it. So uh, I said BFFs, uh, server-side rendering, and templates, um, they can often be a little bit different, but they can often, often follow a lot of those patterns. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that uh, the, the BFF where it's just presentational services is just a backend service. So treat it like that um, and just do everything like the backend services and you won't have any problems. But for server-side rendering or BFFs that are doing templating or um, content uh, management, um, you should actually look at integrating with different services than what I have just talked about. So some of those are going to be your static file store, so like S3 or uh, you know an object store. Um, BFF, best friend forever, yes. Uh, BFF is back end for front end. Um, it was it was in vogue, uh, a Martin Fowler term, I think. Uh, but we heard a lot of it at, uh, at Kroger, so I just use it. Uh, Server-side rendering is SSR, so that would be like um, pre-rendering your React apps or, uh, you know, those old, the old-fashioned template pages are all server-side rendering. Um, they're very quick, but you want to manage how you're doing that. Um, and in some parts, you should actually be pushing that data to your CDN or to your static file serve uh, store on a schedule so that your user isn't hitting the service. They're hitting a cached version that you're regularly refreshing. Um, and you can do the regularly refreshing portion in serverless resources. Uh, I wouldn't encourage you to do uh, your SSR in serverless um, most of the time. I would say that that's kind of ignoring the serverless side of front end that's really good, which is CDNs and static file servers. Um, you can get really good performance by caching things at the edge. So make sure you're pushing all of that out there. Um, it, it's going to be really great for you. So. I just talked for uh, you know 57 minutes. Uh, why why serverless? Uh, so why not serverless? Um, you're gonna notice that there's a huge amount of asterisks here. Uh, I'm biased. I really like serverless. I think that it's great. I have a company that does this, so you should always take this with a grain of salt. But I'll do my best to try to give you why not. Um, your language or framework is slow with startup time. Um, so we've seen this before. Uh, Spring Boot apps uh, tend to have some issues because they have a startup time. They're um, doing dependency injection at runtime and not at compile time. Um, there are ways to cope with this, but it might be too much for you. It might be too much for your team. Um, that should definitely be something you consider. Uh, I would also say Amazon's doing a really good job of mitigating that this, this these days. They have reserved concurrency uh, for serverless where you can have some of them running. Uh, that being said, you do pay for them running. Uh, you do pay for the capacity that's above what you're, uh, you're utilizing. You don't pay as much, but you do pay some of it. Um, so you should be, take that with a grain of salt. Um, you can investigate it. Uh, you can talk to me and I'll help advise you on that. Um, but I would encourage you to look at what's the smallest framework we can get. Could, if we're, if we're dead set on running Java, uh, is Grail VM out of the question? Is, um, is running it without a uh, without an actual like you know HTTP server in there or like framework out of the question? Can we write smaller functions that spin up quicker um, and don't have this lead time? The other one that um, could be a problem for you is uh, is extremely fast apps. So uh, I think for the most part, serverless is rather quick. Um, my my latencies are always under, uh, I think the 99 percentile um, user interaction is under 400 milliseconds uh, with database. That's not simple calls. That's with GraphQL, with complex calls. Um, but my 90% is sub 100 milliseconds. So um, where are those extremely fast apps? Well, it varies a lot. And 
if you really, really need to ensure that somebody's not going to get hit with that 400 milliseconds, um, you might have restrictions that uh, push you more towards writing bespoke servers. Um, that being said, you don't necessarily have to only use bespoke servers. You can use serverless and bespoke servers. Um, what languages are good for serverless? Uh, I wrote all of mine in TypeScript. JavaScript is a uh, good cross-platform um, language for it. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the people who are writing serverless uh, setups will run them in JavaScript. Uh, you you will find uh, Azure has them in JavaScript. Uh, Google Cloud has them in JavaScript. Your custom integrations on Auth0 are in JavaScript. Uh, your custom um, so. Cloudflare calls them workers. They're more like smart cache. Those are in JavaScript. Um, you can test locally uh, the same way you test a function, Ron. Um, there are also some test harnesses that allow you to do uh, serverless offline is one of the, the ones that we used um, back at the last company I worked at, which will uh, hoist all of your functions into a pre-mapped API gateway in Express locally um, and, and test them. So you can either end-to-end -end test. Uh, one thing that I'd encourage is you can actually test them remotely uh, in a different environment. There's no cost to having environments that people don't use. So you can leverage that by giving your, you, giving your developers more access to the cloud resources that are out there. Um, so you can spin up a um, development account that is deeply restricted in what it can do and deeply restricted in what data set it has, but allow users, uh, your internal users, sorry, um, your developers to code within that uh, and they can just have at their heart's delight and just deploy however many apps they want. They can deploy 10 of the same application or every branch um, and that's something that uh, that's something that I'm building deeply into MillServe's feature set so you should talk to me if that's something that interests you. Um, so concerns for vendor lock-in. Uh, one of the big things that I want to say is that uh, I mentioned JavaScript is really great for this um, because you can kind of uh, write it across all platforms. Um, that being said, there, there are ways of running lots of languages in lots of platforms. Uh, but what you're looking for is the vendor lock-in. Um, and JavaScript's really good because you can actually create a facade that says, this is my wrapper that builds it for, for AWS. This is my wrapper that builds it for Google Cloud. And you can actually have the core business logic be the same. Um, and I've been writing these vendor agnostic libraries for some time. Uh, so if that's something that interests you is avoiding lock-in, um, that's something that we can talk about. Because you can still leverage your cloud without locking yourself in. So that's one more thing that I want to encourage is that gradual adoption is possible. You don't have to boil the ocean all at once. You can isolate it to one app. You can isolate it to one endpoint, which is really beautiful. Um, you can even front an old endpoint with your new endpoint and kind of like cache it or do custom logic switching. Um, the world is your oyster. So think about your options and, and ask questions because it might be possible. Um, use it for ETL. Uh, I, you know, these step functions, uh, ETL folks have been loving these for a lot of really big jobs. Uh, I've heard about it a lot in, in um, industry talks. Uh, and internal business apps are really great for trying this stuff out. Um, you can expose it internally only. Uh, API Gateway is really great for that. Um, but you can build it out on compute first uh, and utilize the API gateways that are out there uh, and then decide later that you want custom gateways. So like, say you want better, you want like server sent messages, which isn't supported by, or uh, what is that? That's SSE, server sent events, rather than WebSockets. Or you want to support long polling or short polling. Those are all behaviors that you're not going to get out of Amazon's API gateway. Um, but you can build your own custom gateway that is built on the same practices of horizontal scalability and models itself after that and calls those lambdas or it calls your Google Cloud functions. You can do that, and that's something that you can build around. Uh, you can also build around databases first, uh, which is really a nice way to do it. Um, but it's just one tool in your cloud toolbox. And I wanted to let everybody know about it. Um, so this is my shameless plug. Sorry for this. It's after the time, so hopefully, you know. Um, but MillServe, the company that I uh, own and operate, is focused entirely on streamlining developer productivity using serverless technologies and architectures. Um, it's not about whether or not you're in AWS or using Lambda. 
Um, it's more about this mentality that I'm trying to promote. Uh, and I, I really think that it can be valuable to your developers. Um, so let me help you leverage that technology. Uh, I'm open to, to calls. Um, keep in touch. Like I mentioned, everybody reach out. Uh, you can scan this Discord link and it'll take you to uh, Cincinnati Discord. Um, also, try to join the Cincinnati Tech, uh, Slack Discord. I think we're all joining back up in the Zoom meeting. Uh, Michael, could you clarify in, uh, in chat? I think that's, that's coming up next. Um, but feel free to reach out and email me, david at nullserve.com. Thank you. Hey, I'm in the stream. Bye.